Hi, you're listening to Helen Judney, The Complaining Cow, on the consumer show on East London's radio. And today I have with me Paul Lewis, who's the financial journalist who presents Moneybox on Radio 4. So, Paul, welcome and thank you for your time. It's a pleasure, Helen. Glad to be here. So I would like to talk to you today a bit about pensions, because I think a lot is spoken about and a lot of it goes over people's heads because it certainly goes over mine so and I know you you tend to do quite a lot about pensions a lot of other things but we don't have time to talk about everything so just to start off with can you explain a little to me about the importance of pensions more than you know just it's because it's going to help you have some money when you retire yes I mean you're talking about pensions you pay into there is Mm -hmm. also the state pension which um, people get which is is much more valuable than it used to be but leaving that aside Everybody in work who earns more than £10,000 a year should be auto-enrolled, it's called. They should be put into a a work pension, a company pension, and contributions will be paid into that by them. They'll be taken off their pay and also by whoever employs them will also put money in. Uh, The amount is quite small. The government will tell you it's 8% of your pay altogether. It's not. It's less than that because it's only 8% of your pay above a certain limit of just over £6,000. But it's better than nothing. You at least will have something going into a pension. Of course, many employers pay more than that. And it's sensible to ask your employer if they will pay more, though (laughs) you might get a fairly dusty answer. Why is it important? Well, we have the state pension, which is, you know, going to be about £10,000 a year for people newly retired, um, recently retired next year. Um, but that's not really enough to live on. And so it's very important that you have your own pension to boost that. And the only way to do that is to pay in. Now, the more you pay in, the bigger pension you'll have. And if you look at people in some public sector jobs, like nurses and teachers and so on, uh, they have, roughly speaking, 15 to 20% of their salary goes into a pension to pay them. They don't pay most of it. The employer pays most of it. But that's the sort of amount that's going in to pay a pension, though theirs is actually paid by taxpayers in future. But that's the kind of amount that you can see going in. And the Bank of England, which has the best pension scheme in the country, the Bank of England pays 50% just over into its pension scheme for its employees. So when they reach 60 or 65, they'll have a very nice pension. So the more you put in, the better, basically. And every pound you put in, the kind old Chancellor, you know, Jeremy Hunt, at the moment, anyway, checks, but yeah, it's still Jeremy Hunt. <laughs> when, um, when this goes out in two days' kind... time, it might not be, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We will see. I think we've hit a period of stability, thank goodness, for Mm. a certain length of time anyway. Um, The kind old Chancellor of the Treasury, if you like, puts in an extra 25% for every pound you put in out of your taxed income because that's the tax you would have paid on that. So the extra money goes in. So the contributions come from you, from your employer and from the government. And if you don't pay into a pension, you lose all of that, um, all of that extra money going in. So it's always worth doing if you can afford it to try and make sure you have at least something when you're either too old or too bored or just don't want to work anymore when you get to 65 or so. Is there a limit to how much you can put in? Yes, there are limits. You can't put in more than you earn in a year. So if you earn 25,000, you can't put more than 25,000 into your pension, which seems a bit silly because no one would. But, you know, some people who've got a lot of other sources of income might. You can't put in more than 40,000 in a year. So if you're on a very high salary, there is a limit of 40,000 while you're in work to go into your pension. But those really are the two restrictions on it. And when I say you put 40,000 in, you actually put in 32,000 and the Chancellor puts in the rest. So, um, it's that I mean, that is a very good deal, obviously. The other thing to say is if you're lucky enough to earn enough to pay higher rate tax, 40 percent tax, that's an income over 50,000 odd, 50,270, then you will get tax relief on that at 40 percent. So you will actually get for every pound you put in, the Chancellor will put in, believe it or not, about 67 pounds. So that is sorry for every hundred pounds you put in, the Chancellor will put in about 67 pounds. So that's an even better deal if you pay higher rate tax. 
is there a limit to to how many pensions you can have? So if you pay into a private pension, maybe you're freelance and you think I've got this pension from when I had a work pension, I've kept that one on and now I'm going to open another one. Are you allowed to do those kinds of things? Yeah, this is going to be one of the problems in the future because people change jobs much more frequently now. And mm -hmm. also because of the auto enrolment, the fact you're automatically put into a pension with every job you're in, if you earn more than £10,000 a year, people are going to have six, eight, ten, a dozen pensions that um, they've paid into during their working life. Mm -hmm. And it, it's sometimes quite difficult to consolidate them while you're working because rather stupidly, I think, when you move jobs, you can't take your pension with you usually. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's a real effort. It stays with the employer that you were working for and, and the pension they were paying into. So when you do reach pension age, and it's happening already, you will find that people have half a dozen or more pensions. That's okay, as long as you haven't paid more than the limit 40,000 a year into them during a year. There's also something called the lifetime allowance, which is just over a million pounds now. So you can't have more than a million pounds in your pension fund. And I can just see people <laughs> going, what? <laughs> well, but it's true if you if you do pay a lot in, particularly if you're in a well-paid public sector job where you get this salary, this um, pension related to your salary, you can have a pension worth more than that. So that's the other limit. The important thing about that is you've got to find these pensions. At the moment, there is no one place to go where they're all brought together. Though there are plans for that, what's called a pensions dashboard, but it keeps getting put off. I've no idea when we'll see it. It, it will be year, well, a couple of years at the earliest, I think, from now. But there is something the government has what's called its pension tracing service. So go to gov.uk, the government website, and search pension tracing and you'll find it, and then you put in, you know, your old addresses, your old employers, and things like that, and it should manage to find your pensions. There's also something called Gretel, gretel.co.uk, which has some pensions on it, and which is also free, or completely free. A word of warning, though, don't go onto Google or another search engine and simply say, find my lost pension because you will get a lot of commercial companies mm -hmm. that really are there to take money off you rather than help you find your own money. So you can do it all free on the gov.uk website or on Gretel. That is growing, but it's still quite small. If you had, you know, you move and you go to like your fifth job, or your sixth job, and you've got your sixth pension, but actually that one doesn't pay in very much. And you think you've been paying into a private pension. Mm -hmm. Can you be paying into both at the same time? Yeah, you can pay into a private pension as well, um, a personal pension. Nowadays, they're normally called SIPs, self-invested personal pensions. And you find those through a good independent financial advisor. Normally, um, they will find a SIP provider. The, the, the charges can be quite high. And, and you, although they're called self-invested, which means you decide where they're mm -hmm. invested, most of us haven't got a clue where to invest our pension funds. So normally, the advisor will suggest things and they may not or may not be very good suggestions but that is another way you can certainly have a private pension as well as long as you don't exceed that limit of up to forty thousand pounds a year going into your pension from all sources including the treasury then you can have as many pensions as you like actually and if your boss is a bit mean and doesn't top up your auto enrollment more than they should uh, more than they are obliged to then it's perfectly reasonable to take out another one I have to say, though, Helen, I mean, at the present time with the cost of living crisis, what I hear from people is, should I stop paying to my pension? Mm, because you can yeah. opt out, even of auto enrollment pensions. You can opt out. I absolutely don't advise it. But, you know, if the choice is paying your fuel bill or buying food for your family or keeping them in warm clothing, keeping the heating on, I can fully understand why people think of that. But, of course, when you do that, you lose the bit from your employer and you lose the bit from the treasury so you know if you're if if say a hundred pounds is going into your pension every month and you stop paying in you don't get a hundred pounds you just get the bit you would have paid in without the tax relief and without the employer contribution so you shouldn't do it but if you have to do it absolutely understand but mm -hmm. when this crisis is over and let's hope it is over in the foreseeable future then start again because the longer your money's in the pension the more it's growing and the better off you will be 
when you reach that magic age of 65 or whenever you decide to retire in future. And can you put, if you do say stop it for six months in a year while you pay your, you know, your energy bills instead, can you then put a lump sum in if you might get, you know, a, a pay rise or something? Can you put a lump sum in to make up for the time that you mm. didn't pay? You can't normally put one into your work pension, but you could certainly put one into a pension that you pay for yourself. And you can always opt back into the company pension. In fact, once you've opted out, they will come back to you after three years, I think it is, and automatically opt you back in. So you have to opt out yeah. again. You're also opted in every time you move jobs. So you can opt in back in at any time, but you can't put a lump sum in unless your employer is very kind and says, OK, you had a holiday for six months, I'll put all my contributions in and you put all yours in. That would be possible. But of course, you've got to find the money, which you may well not have. Yeah, yeah. So what is the best thing? Somebody thinks, right, I really need to start taking out a pension. Obviously, you know, the best time to start a pension is when you're 18, presumably. But, <laughs> you know, where do people actually go to go and find the best advice? You know, and how they find the best advisor? How do they do that? That's a very difficult question. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first thing is, if you're in a job, you're earning over 10,000, it should be going into a pension. Mm -hmm. And you have no control normally over where it goes. So you just have to rely on your employer and the firm they choose to manage it. If you want to set up your own pension, or indeed, if you want to save, you want to put some money aside into investments, then ideally, you should find what's called an independent financial advisor. And I stress the word independent, mm -hmm. not any old financial advisor, not your bank financial, ad financial advisor, but an independent one. They are quite hard to find. And before you start looking, there is a lot of free advice around. There's a website called moneyhelper.org.uk, which is actually a government run website. It's supported by the government. That has very good general advice about pensions moneyhelper.org.uk and there is also um, citizens advice can help you they do contract some of their work to citizens advice you can they can give you mm -hmm. some advice and there's something called the pensions advisory service which is now part of money helper but if you go onto the money helper website you should find the details of that they can all give you free a uh, completely free advice about pensions and if you're very very careful you will find some online i mean you know you've always got to be careful online because there are all these sharks out there waiting mm -hmm. to take your money if you've got a reasonable amount of money i mean suppose you you know i wouldn't say you're fortunate but <laughs> supposing a, a, a wealthier relative dies and you inherit some money or perhaps you get a payment or a settlement for something or i don't know you know, you get divorced and you get some money. If you get a lump sum of some sort, or you've got a very good job and you can afford to put a lot of money a month into a, an investment, then find an independent financial advisor. But more and more, they want people with what they call wealth. How much wealth have you got? And if you've got less than six figures, less than 100,000, or you want to pay in less than two or 300 pounds a month, it can be quite hard to find mm -hmm. an independent financial advisor to do that. What's the best way for people to to find a financial advisor? The best way not to is to search on Google. So don't search for a financial advisor on Google. Don't go on, <laughs> right, yeah. don't go on social media. They are generally not regulated financial advisors. You've got to have someone who is regulated. You've also got to have someone who is independent. And that's a very important dis distinction because an independent financial advisor will look at the whole market, everything that's available, and find what's best for you. The other sort of advisor technically is called a restricted financial advisor because they can only look at a certain range of products or products from a certain organization advisors in banks are all like that they will only sell you the bank's products so find an independent financial advisor and the way to start is you go online and there are three big directories of financial advisors one is called advisor book advisorbook.co.uk I think that's probably my favourite. It has more than 12,000, I think, regulated firms on it. Another one is called unbiased.co.uk. 
and there's one s in unbiased i say that because i always put two in but there's one <laughs> unbiased.co.uk and that lists several many thousand eighteen thousand, i think and they are all independent advisors on there and the final one is called vouched for vouched for.co.uk they're all a bit different they all have different strengths but that's where you can go and they will take your postcode and they will find you know recommend local advisors and you can put in the kind of person you want you can even with some of them select a male or female advisor which can be useful for some people like that a lot of women trust women more than they mm -hmm. do mm -hmm. men and so do some men come to that <laughs> and but the, the things you've got to check are are they independent yes big tick are they qualified are they a certified or um, chartered financial planner that would be my second criterion and within that you'll get people with specific pension qualifications and the third thing and this is my slightly more controversial way of looking at things how do they charge you and I have this kind of thing mm, about yeah. <laughs> financial yeah. advisors who charge you a percentage of your money because it's like a wealth tax you know it's your money why should you pay them a percentage of it every year so get them to charge you a fee and honestly some of these fees will seem quite high i mean they could say okay i'll find the best pension i'll charge you a thousand pounds you think oh my goodness but if they take one percent of your money or one and a half percent of your money every year you can pretty soon clock up to that amount so ask them to if you can pay a fee that normally normally is the best way to do it so independent chartered or certified and charge in pounds if possible and if i can just plug my blog here because i do have all this <laughs> set out in of lot course, of detail, yeah. as paullewismoney.blogspot.com search financial advice and you will find a whole list of how to go about finding a financial advisor but as i say one of the things you will see on all these websites is how much wealth do you need before they even look at you? And some of mm -hmm. them, it can be quite a lot of money. So they are quite expensive, but they do give the very best advice usually. So and here's one, people. Can you explain to me what is the triple lock? Well, we're back to the state pension now. Yeah. The triple lock is a it's a political commitment. It's not a legal requirement. It's a political commitment by all the main parties at the moment. The state pension goes up each year, roughly in line with inflation. That's the idea. You know, your pension every April, the pension will go up because mm -hmm. prices have gone up or mm -hmm. wages have gone up or whatever. The triple lot was invented some years ago as a way of making sure pension has always got some sort of rise in the state pension. And so every April, your pension should go up by either the rise in wages or the rise in prices, what we call inflation, or mm -hmm. there's a sort of minimum rise of two and a half percent. So if wage is flat and inflation is flat as it was a few years ago, that doesn't prices don't go up, wages don't go up much, you'll still get two and a half percent rise in your pension. Normally, wages go up by more than prices. So normally your pension will go up with wages. This year, this coming year, in fact, um, wages were less than inflation, quite a lot less. So your pension, your state mm -hmm. pension, if you have one, will go up by inflation, which was 10.1% in September. And it's roughly speaking, you know, for every £10 you get, you'll get another pound on your pension, roughly. So it's quite a big rise. But that that was the triple lock in, in practice, because inflation was the highest of those three numbers, two and a half wages and inflation it was the highest so you've got inflation last year i should say this year but last april wages went up by far more than prices but guess what the government decided it would not put pensions up by wages it would just mm -hmm. put them up by prices so it paused the triple lock and i have to say i don't think the triple lock will survive beyond the next election i don't think the political party's commitment to it will be maintained and in future, I think pensioners should expect their pension to go up with with a rise in prices, the general rise in prices rather than wages. But that's only my guess. I may be wrong. And I think as the next election approaches, because it's you know a couple of years before the next election, probably uh, there will be pressure on them to commit to the triple lot, whether they will, we'll have to see. Um, but that's it. It's a complicated way to make sure pensioners benefit from the general rise in the economy, growth in the economy. 
Yeah, it is. I mean, it is complicated, isn't it? I think for people to get their their heads round. I mean, the other thing that I think is is complicated is is what is the WASPI campaign? Well, state pension age for men and for women is sixty six now. It was until let's say twenty ten, so quite a few years ago now. It was sixty five for men and 60 for women. It had been 60 for women since World War II, which is, you know, a history lesson for most people around today. Why it was different for those ages, I won't go into, but Mm -hmm. anyway, it was 60 for women, 65 for men. And the government decided, in fact, oh goodness, it was decided a very, very long time ago, that the state pension would rise for women, the state pension age for women would rise to 65. It was thought to be fairer that if both sexes had their pension at the same age. Um, and there were suggestions that ultimately the government would be forced to do that because of age discrimination, because it was age discrimination in favour of women against men. So anyway, they decided to raise the state pension age to 65 for women. And they set out a very sort of long plan. It was going to start in 2010 and it was going to slowly stretch away for a number of years. Year by year, the pension age would go up by sort of six months every every year. Mm-hmm. But that was speeded up by the Chancellor George Osborne when he was the Chancellor. Um, and he decided to speed up the pension age rise for women. And at the same time, a new state pension was introduced, a bigger one than applied to older people. And those two things got slightly across each other. And women then found that suddenly their state pension age was rising very rapidly. A lot of these women said, and I think there's a lot of truth in this, they didn't know their pension age was going up at all. So they reached the age of 60 Mm -hmm. in sort of, I don't know, 2015, 2016. And they thought, goodness, I'm not going to retire at 60, it's going to be 65. And oh, goodness, no, it's going to be 66. And they got very angry and they felt they'd lost five or even six years pension in some cases. And they said, we want it back. And they launched a big campaign, a very vocal campaign, I have to say. Unfortunately for them, it wasn't an effective campaign. The state pension age carried on rising and no compensation has been given to those women who feel very strongly that they were cheated out of five or six years pension. And I think the one of the reasons why they felt so cheated was A, they expected to get their pension at 60. They planned their life around that. Mm-hmm. They hadn't seen the adverts. They hadn't read anything. Who would? I mean, I've spent my life reading everything about pensions, but most <laughs> people are much more interesting than me. They don't do it. So... They felt cheated. And they also then realised at the age of 60 that they had to carry on working. And as any women listening to this will know, or watching this will know, once you're even in your late 50s, it is difficult to get work for, for women particularly. Mm, There's mm-hmm, this mm. unfortunate combination of ageism and sexism that makes it difficult for women in their 50s and particularly in their early to mid 60s to get work employers would rather have someone else despite all the skills they might have despite the qualifications Mm -hmm. despite their experience it is difficult and there was a report out recently about the gender pay gap which is at its maximum between men and women at that sort of age you know late 50s early 60s so many of them although they wanted to work found they couldn't or found the work they could get was very little they found they couldn't claim benefits because either they might they they were married they had a husband or a partner and that meant they couldn't claim as an individual and even if they tried to claim benefits to fill that gap they came with first of all benefits for people under pension age are pretty low and they come with very very tough work search conditions so they really had to spend most of the working week looking for work that they really thought they would never get to get their 70 pounds a week you know benefits <laughs> So th- there are a bunch of very, very angry women about this. Slowly, of course, they are reaching 66 and they're getting their pension. And every politician knows that, oh, if we just wait another few years, this will all go away because mm-hmm. they'll be getting a pension. And that's exactly what happened. And th- there is a whole cohort, as they call it, of sort of 
women, uh, women of the 50s, they call themselves, born in the 1950s, who are moving through now to get their pension. But a lot of them are still very angry. And of course, a lot of them still don't have their pension because they haven't yet reached 66. And the WASPI campaign was all about getting them compensation. And everything they've tried has failed. And do you think that that it's it's game over for them now? I'm afraid I do. I mean, you know, the parliamentary ombudsman is going to make some pronouncement. The parliamentary ombudsman has said there was maladministration by the Department for Work and Pensions in not informing people. You know, and they didn't write to everybody. They relied on adverts and things like this. Mm -hmm. But I don't think anything will come of that, because even if the parliamentary ombudsman says to the government, you should pay these women something, which I'm, I'm very doubtful that they will, the government can ignore it. The government is under no obligation to mm. do what the parliamentary ombudsman tells them to do. So I think politicians will just wait. And it's a huge amount of money that we're talking about. George Osborne, the chancellor I mentioned earlier, when he raised the state pension age again from 65 to 66 and speeded up the, the acceleration for women, said at a conference in Europe, I think it was, you know, that's the easiest six billion quid I've ever saved. It's a lot of money. Again, in the present climate, I don't think there's any chance they'll get it. Yeah, I mean, you talk about the the parliamentary ombudsman, of course, the pensions ombudsman. Do you see many complaints about pensions going to the ombudsman? Well, there are different ombudsmen. I mean, this is one of the confusing things. There are three, really. The the parliamentary ombudsman is about Mm -hmm. maladministration only, um, and it has to be about a government department that is guilty of maladministration. It hasn't done things properly. That doesn't really have much power, but it does produce reports to say the government or the department should have done this, that or the other. And then there are two ombudsmen that deal with pensions. There's the pensions ombudsman Mm -hmm. who deals with pensions that are come from your job and generally ones that are related to your salary. So if you're lucky enough to have a pension that pays you a proportion of your salary when you retire, that's where you go. You go to the pensions ombudsman. And then there is the financial uh, ombudsman service which relates to all other investments and pensions and everything to do with regulated financial services whether it's banks or pension companies or insurers or whatever so there's there's sort of different places you can go but you can only go there if if something has really gone wrong and you've put in a complaint and it's not mm-hmm. been met they're not really like a sort of second opinion they're more like maybe the police is a bit too extreme but they're where you go when something has really gone wrong and and they have to force a company to do something yeah. and the financial com- the financial ombudsman service and the pensions ombudsman can force companies to do things but only if they've really done if they've missold you something i mean if they've lied to you um uh, it, they, you can't go there if something hasn't done quite as well as you hoped it would so they're quite yeah. tough it's quite a high barrier to get there yeah, I think that's that's what people would see uh, as a as an issue, wouldn't they, with the ombudsman? It's like sort of the energy bills; they're so high. I want to complain to the ombudsman, but mm. that's they can't deal yeah. with that unless there's mistakes being made. And it's obviously the same with the financial ombudsman. But do you yeah. see many mistakes made with sort of pensions? You know, we see it a lot. We you know, people take bank go to about banks and 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 you know credit card companies to financial ombudsman all the time. But is it is it fewer with pensions? Yes, it is a lot fewer. One of the big things that goes wrong with pensions is once you're in your mid-50s, once you're 55, if you have a pension that is related to your salary, you've been, you and your employer have been paying in, um, you're, in, you're allowed to take the value of that pension out. And this happened with a whole group of steel workers. They were, they were into the British Steel Pension Scheme. British Steel was taken over. Um, and there was a lot of concern that the pension scheme might not be able to pay those pensions. And a lot of financial advisors said to steel workers, they would go to uh, in Wales where the steel works were, they would go and sit outside the gates and talk to people and say, oh, you know, you can get two or three hundred thousand pounds out of your pension, which was often true. But what do you do with that two or three hundred thousand pounds? You cannot buy a pension that would have been as good as the pension you mm-hmm. had if you left it there because it gave you an index link pension for the rest of your life. They're, they're very expensive to buy. So that's the kind of thing that goes wrong, that kind of misadvice. And it really did go wrong there. And there are an awful lot of cases have gone to the ombudsman because these financial advisors misled people 
largely because they could take fees for getting their pension out. Some of them would advise them to invest it in very, very dodgy places and they'd get more fees from that. And guess what? The ombudsman would say, OK, you've got to pay all these people compensation and the firm would go bust. The advisor would go bust and disappear. And then you're left going to the financial compensation scheme, the financial services compensation scheme, which has limits on what it can pay out. There's now a special fund. The financial conduct authority has set up to help people, but it's probably not enough. So those are the kind of things when you are lied to or misled, particularly for something that is in to the financial advantage of the advisor as much mm -hmm. as you, then you can go and take a complaint and you'll probably win. But what you'll actually get is probably not as much as you have lost in many cases. Those are the kind of cases we see, and they are very, very sad. I mean, people have lost a lot of money. I suppose the other ones in financial uh, to do with pensions, they well, they also relate to people being persuaded to move their funds abroad into dodgy investments that may not even exist abroad. There are all sorts of problems like that. So if you've got a good pension, you've got a pension fund of your own, or you've got a pension from your job that's worth money, the best answer is just leave it where it is because it will provide you with a pension. And all the people who say to you, oh, we can do better than that, they can't. So never, ever be tempted to take your pension out and reinvest it because the chances are you'll be worse off and you may lose a lot of money. Well, that's a very good note to end on, I think. So where can people find you and all of your connections and books and everything, Paul? <laughs> well, they can. I'm here. No, no, they can find me all over the place, uh, Helen. Uh, as you kindly said, I present Moneybox on Radio 4, which is midday on every Saturday, just about, and um, even over Christmas. I write for numerous places. I write for Saga magazine every month. I write for Radio Times every week. I write every month or so for Financial Times, the Daily Telegraph. I have my blog, which I mentioned, which is paullewismoney.blogspot.com. And I have 150 odd thousand people follow me on Twitter at Paul Lewis Money. And you can find me on Twitter and you can send me a direct message. I'm very happy if you send me a direct message. People do. I just may ignore you, but I generally try to answer the ones I can. I do get quite a lot. And if it's an interesting story. If it's something I think I can help with, then I will reply. And, you know, we can have an email exchange after that. And, of course, I have just written, I say, of course, people may not know, I've just written a book. Called, it's called Moneybox. It's published by Penguin Random House under the BBC um, imprint. And if you search Moneybox uh, and my name on Amazon or Waterstones or any of these places, you will find that book or on Kindle. Uh, and I even recorded it so you can hear me reading my book, which is an interesting experience, I have to say, Helen. I don't know if you've ever done that. <laughs> but it, it took three days. I read the whole book and I hope it's been very neatly edited together because I did have to stop quite a few times. But if you're an insomniac, that will put you straight to sleep, I'm sure. <laughs> so there's all sorts of places to find me. And um, uh, Paul Lewis Money is my kind of money handle. Um, PaulLewis.co.uk uh, will find something. But that's a very out of date website. But anyway, I'm I'm all over the place, but um, always what, glad to hear from people. What can people expect to find in your book? Well, for the book, I took a different approach to most books or any book, as far as I know. It's a guide to money from 0 to 99. So it, it follows your life. It's everything you need to know at different ages. So it looks at, you know, obviously chapter, the early chapters when you're naught, that's for your parents to read, <laughs> right through to your teens when you can read it, of course, then your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, and then right up to when you reach pension age and we talk about the things that pensioners can get and what you should do and making a will. So it's got all those things in it right, right through. It covers tax, it covers benefits, it covers investments, it covers savings um, and explains the rules. And it explains how the financial world works, which is not often in our interests. I have to say it, the financial services industry, I often say it's a bit like a, a, a sort of vague acquaintance that you have to meet from time to time but they always make you pay for the drinks, you know. So it's a bit of an expose in a way of how the financial system works. And there's also a chap there's chapters on love and money because, you know, we can 
have love and money at any time in our life. We can meet someone, we can um, have a financial relationship with them, uh, and then it may all go horribly wrong. So love and money, fraud is a big thing. There's a chapter on fraud because mm -hmm. we can be defrauded at any age. And also there's something about social media, which, you know, never, ever, ever, ever take financial advice from social media because um, it's generally a very, very bad idea. Mm -hmm. um, so be very careful about social media. There are a few regulated advisors on there. If you find them, okay, what they say will be sensible. They won't be inveigling you into some get rich quick scheme. There aren't any get rich, rich quick schemes that work that are available to people. So just ignore them. <laughs> no, um, and it's about budgeting. Not. <laughs> it's about budgeting, you know, because the only mm. way to manage your money is to know what's going in, know what's going out and do a bit of arithmetic and adding and subtracting. Everyone can do that and everyone can budget if they put their mind to it. Well, thank you very much for speaking to me, Paul. That's really, really good. Always good to speak to you. So it's um, my just, pleasure. It's nice to talk to you. Helen. Yeah. And just uh, just remains for me to say thank you. And if you have a consumer issue you'd like me to talk about or a consumer problem you'd like help with, then you can contact me at Helen at eastlondonradio.org.uk and you can find me in lots of consumer advice and topical issues and saving money on the website www.thecomplainingcow.co.uk twitter at complaining cow and instagram and facebook on the complaining cow and you can get 15 percent discount on my books how to complain the essential consumer guide to getting refunds redress and results and 101 habits uh, of an effective complainer with the code ELR15. Thanks very much and see you next time. Bye.